hopefully you have in front of you um, something that resembles that. Um, does your school's assessment policy pass the EIS test? And I brought that along today because really that's the, 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 the basis from which um, I'm going to be presenting. Um, that's, that really is the kind of like the summary of EIS policy in relation to assessment. We produced it a couple of years ago when the hares were set running by the First Minister's announcement that she wanted to reintroduce national standardised assessment um, for all children in Scotland um, you know, with the intention of results being published, school to school comparison, all of that kind of thing and that has that sparked a real debate among our members about the role of standardised assessment the purpose of standardised assessment and more generally what assessment good assessment policy should look like in their establishments and we didn't write anything new the EIS didn't write anything new in response to the questions that we were being asked this is long-standing EIS policy about how you conduct um, sound assessment practice in the classroom um, and really this was just a campaigning tool um, we, we created that using you know big long documents that explained in a lot of detail the intricacies of EIS policy but we extrapolated the main themes from that the main points from that the headline the headline messages and created this uh, campaigning poster that was then sent out to all schools you know that they could reference it was a quick you know snapshot reference to the you know the kind of like wider context of EIS policy and I brought it along for you today so that you can see that the context from which I'm going to be speaking but also um, you know I suppose I've been a bit mischievous and I'm going to put the um, Scottish Government standardised assessments for P1 to this test that the EIS has um, constructed as a kind of um, temperature taking of how good assessment policy is in any context. So the question that I'm going to seek to answer today is are SNSAs for P1 passing the EIS test? I'm going to look at that in terms of yes or no. Pass or fail, that's a bit harsh that language isn't it? The Scottish Government have been keen to tell us that that's not the language of standardised assessment. It's high, medium, low performance. So you'll see that um, I've, I've kind of colour coded that. That's support, well, it's supposed to be um, green, orange and red. The colours are coming out a bit strangely uh, on the, the screen here and maybe a little bit muted on your, um, oh, sorry, on my own slides as well. That was to do with my own, my own uh, uh, printer, but hopefully this will work. You'll be able to discern the different colours as we go along. So, um, yeah, a bit of a diagnostic assessment then on um, the SNSAs for P1 so far. Um, to give you a bit more background, in 2017, when um, our members were particularly exercised by what was being proposed by the Scottish Government at the time, this resolution was passed at our 2017 AGM. There was real concern that the Scottish Government was about to set um, Scottish, ed Scottish education on a path that would um, mean kind of like retrograde, you know, be a retrograde path in terms of the gains of Curriculum for Excellence and what Curriculum for Excellence had strived to achieve in terms of the, the learning experience for young people people, the role of teacher professional judgment in the midst of that and the role of formative assessment at the heart of that as well and there was real concern at the time that the, the, the plans for national standardised assessing, assessment would be detrimental to learning and teaching and our members asked that the EIS, if they found this over time to be detrimental, asked that they would be balloted on industrial action around the SNSAs. So we didn't take a knee-jerk response to that, we said that this was going to be something that we would have to monitor over time and um, we have been doing a series of monitoring exercises since the assessments were introduced um, just, just last session. And one of the things that we did was survey our members in the summer of last, last session. Um, and a lot of the information I'm going to bring to you today comes from that survey data that we gathered at that time. So um, Sue had asked me to, to um, say a bit about whether or not, um, or, or to say a bit about the EIS view in relation to the curriculum, you know, curriculum planning, SNSAs in relation to curriculum planning. And actually that's a question that we asked our members when we, when we put that survey out um, in June of last year. We were asking questions around the extent to which um, the assessment genuinely supported learning. It's the first question and the most crucial question actually on that poster uh, that you have there. And we asked them questions around its alignment with um, curriculum, for ex uh, curriculum for Excellence, how well um, articulated with the you know the concepts that underpin that 
Our members told us that, the, um, that they could see reflected reasonably strongly um, the, the E's and O's and the benchmarks. They could see that some aspects of curriculum content were covered. They were clear, of course, that um, there was a, a relatively narrow coverage of the E's and O's uh, within literacy and numeracy. They're much more expansive than, you know, than, than, the, um, than those that are um, actually tackled, if you like, in the assessments. And they also raised some questions for us about aspects of the, the content of the, um, the, the assessments, maybe not articulating that strongly with the E's and O's and the benchmarks. So particularly around literacy, um, the children were being asked to read passages that they thought were far too difficult for, for, for four and five year olds. Um, there were some, um, you know, letter combinations that, that would have been utterly unfamiliar to, to the P1s um, and even in numeracy which seemed to go with was less incident and was less difficulty overall than literacy. There was suggestion that the, that the way that a lot of the questions had been phrased were too wordy, you know, too, too, far too text based and there was a lot of um, emphasis on calendar, number lines, data handling that, that four and five year olds hadn't yet covered within their early level curriculum. So that's actually supposed to be orange, that's a kind of, you know, not, not not dreadful, but our, our members did have some concerns about um, some of the curriculum content, even although they could see E's and O's and benchmarks reflected in some of the question types. We asked them about the extent to which the, the assessments articulated with the four capacities and we had a, 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 a number of comments that were saying that they couldn't see the, the four capacities reflected at all. Um, and in fact, um, not only that, some, some members expressing concern, for example, in relation to the, um, the capacity around confidence building, that they actually saw that these um, assessments were eroding and undermining of confidence rather than um, sort of like you know, fitting a picture that is about nurturing the whole child, educating the whole child, um, they, they actually saw that the, the, the assessments were detrimental to that. So that's why I've got that one in red. In terms of principles of curriculum design, breadth, depth, relevance, enjoyment, coherence, there were a number of concerns flagged to us um, around these areas. I've already mentioned the, the, the issue of breadth and in particular there was concern about writing and the fact that the, the literacy assessment cannot assess um, writing, it can assess only the tools of writing but not actually the creation of text so there was some concern and disappointment expressed by our members around that. Um, in terms of relevance, uh, we had comments to suggest that children would be asked questions about areas of experience, areas of learning that they hadn't been exposed to. Um, in terms of enjoyment, very few people said that the young people enjoyed the assessments. In fact, um, we had a lot of evidence to suggest that young people were distressed by them, they were bored by them, they didn't find them engaging, they didn't find them as enjoyable as other aspects of um, the learning that they, that they were engaged in um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And overall, this sense that the, that the assessments were a kind of bolt-on, a kind of uncomfortable bolt-on, rather than something that, that was a, a kind of coherent addition to, um, you know, to their assessment um, activity. Um, in terms of um, the, the, the cornerstone principles of, of curriculum for excellence, it's supposed to be a bespoke, um, it's, or it's supposed to enable the creation of bespoke curricula by, uh, by teachers responding to the particular experiences, needs, um, the opportunities that, are, that, that present themselves in their own, in their own settings. The, Assessments came externally without any involvement of teachers in their, in their design. So there was a kind of dissonance, if you like, in terms of um, what the children often were being asked to do in the assessments and what their, you know, what their particular learning experience had been up until, up until that time. Formative assessment, teachers were saying, well, you know, that, that, that's not really anywhere um, in this. Um, there, there, there continues to be confusion around the purpose of the assessments. I think that this emanates um, in some part from the fact that originally the, the assessments were intended to be summative um, in, their, in their purpose. We know now that um, there, there, there were uh, modifications and amendments made to the, to the original design and they do serve a diagnostic purpose, but there continues to be some uh, confusion, I would say, about their overall purpose and where they sit in relation to the wider formative assessment picture. Um, and I'll say more, a little bit more about that later. In terms of the, the role of the teacher in making decisions about um, you know, learning objectives, about assessment mechanisms, about context for assessment, none of that really was, was, um, was evident in the way that the SNSAs were introduced for our members. Um, and again, I'll say more about that uh, a little bit later on. 
Um, we asked about the accessibility of the assessments to, to four and five year olds for an assessment to be meaningful. The young people who are using it have to be able to engage with it and this was a real area um, of concern. I'm sure you'll have discussed this at length already in this, in this forum. Um, time and time again our members said that the young people that they were working with didn't have the digital and keyboard, keyboard skills that were required to, um, you know, to make their way through the assessment uh, sensibly. They talked about the, the inaccessibility of um, a lot of the language to, to learners of that age. Um, issues as well with font, layout, the density of the text, these things, you know, being barriers actually to their access to the assessment rather than uh, facilitators and, you know, the nature of some of the assessment tasks themselves, not, not least the fact that it was a kind of digital assessment um, that lasted quite a, quite a lengthy period of time, our members were telling us, for some of the young people um, and then the, you know, the, the nature of some of the questions were thought to, was thought to be inappropriate as well as I've already mentioned. So that's all red, okay, that, the, the, those were all sort of like red flags flags being waved to us about, um, about you know, what the assessments actually looked like. So um, I was speaking to, to Sue at the beginning here and she, she stressed the importance of this forum being about practitioner voice mm -hmm. and I wanted to bring some of that to you today um, from the survey. That was you know, one of the, the comments that we had from a Glasgow teacher about um, her or his impression of the assessments for the young people that, um, you know, that they were presented to in that context. Um, too long, losing focus, losing interest, becoming anxious, refusing to answer any more questions, um, the number of questions being problematic. So that raises real questions about the validity of that kind of assessment, um, regardless of whether it's a formative assessment or, sorry, a diagnostic assessment or a, a summative assessment. We asked the question also about the usefulness of the SNSA data uh, for teachers because a big part of the kind of selling of them had been that they were going to provide teachers with you know really meaningful useful um, you know a myriad of data that they wouldn't otherwise have um, and this was really going to be impactful in terms of identifying kids who had difficulties um, and, and you know working to, to, to close the poverty related attainment gap so we asked questions of our teachers about that <coughs> teachers were saying often that the data was unreliable, they could see that it was unreliable um, in relation to the wider picture of um, assessment that they'd already um, gathered really from, um, you know, from the, 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 the plethora of things that they were already doing around assessment and for some of the reasons that I've already outlined in terms of the design of the assessments. So children were accidentally clicking or they were clicking too quickly and then they were unable to go back. So that was giving a false picture um, in terms of you know, how kids were performing in relation to particular, particular questions. And at the point at which children start to guess because they've, lo they've, lo they've lost interest, then of course there are questions about reliability. So for all of these reasons, we saw um, comments coming through quite often about um, teachers not entirely trusting the data that they got back. Often they were saying, yep, you know, I could see, I could see the result, I could see how the result, um, you know, matched what that child could do at that point in time. But actually, for a lot of effort, a lot of investment of time and resource, that told me nothing new about the child's strengths, their learning needs, or the next steps. The teachers were saying, I already knew what they were. I already had a wealth of data in relation to these, uh, to these things from my own observations, my own um, self-constructed assessments, or assessments that have been co-designed by teachers in the school. Um, so time and time again, we, you know, we had the, uh, the, the sense that, that there had been huge investment of time, huge investment of resource, you know, gnashing of teeth, wringing of hands, and actually that the, the, the assessments didn't, didn't um, provide any more than teachers already had. And then there, were, there, there was complaint also about the kind of data that teachers were provided at times, um, too much information, you know, far too much detail to be able to really comprehend for um, individual children, a whole class of children, um, get, you know, the, the, the sort of like data reports, you know, really being pretty, um, pretty uh, intricate, if you like, and teachers saying, I actually don't have time to engage with the level of data that, the, that these assessments are, are providing. Teachers often hadn't seen the assessments, um, the, the, you know, the children went off to sit them in other parts of the school, depended how the, the, the school um, had, had you know, uh, planned for the assessments to be undertaken. Often it was head teachers and deputy heads who were taking the kids out of the class to sit them and teachers never actually got to see them. So they, they found it quite difficult then to interpret what the results were actually saying because they hadn't seen the questions. Um, and then just a, a, a general lack of understanding of the kind of 
uh, language that was being used in the learner reports and that comes down in some part to training and um, we know that not everybody was able to access the training that was required in time for the SNSAs being rolled out or if they did you know there are perhaps questions about the quality of some of that training so there was no sense at all that teachers felt comfortable or confident in being able to um, handle the data that the SNSAs uh, generated and there are a couple of examples to, to exemplify that Um, so, we asked questions as well about um, not only the, the quality of the assessment um, in terms of um, it, it, its intrinsic value, but we asked questions around um, the relationship of that piece of assessment to... Stop already? Really? <laughs> really? <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, questions about you know, it, the, the, the relationship of SNSAs to wider learning and assessment. Um, and again, Teachers were clear that this was a very, very costly exercise in, ter in terms of human resource. Um, time being taken away from additional support needs, from PEF projects, from uh, senior managers' management time, all to invest in um, SNSA delivery, and teachers didn't think that this was worthwhile. Um, again, uh, we'll send out the presentation after, and you can look at these in your, in your own time. Um, does it support play-based learning? We... Um, EIS absolutely endorses, you know, the, the spirit of the building, the ambition document, the most recent Scottish Government document, you know, that, that kind of provides guidance on the delivery of early years education and the importance of play within that. We absolutely endorse the, the principles of that. We liaise often with European counterparts where, as you know, in many European countries, there's a kindergarten stage, so ki kids don't start formally learning in a school setting until they're age seven. And we uh, engage with um, counterparts through Education International and they are absolutely bamboozled by the fact that the progressive Scottish Government has um, you know, set, this, set this whole initiative uh, in, in motion whereby children as young as four and five are being formally assessed through SNSA and of course we came in behind the Upstart Play Not Test campaign that you know, really gathered traction in the summer um, and we're convinced by the arguments that actually that kind of um, formal assessment of, of young people at that early stage in their learning can actually be a detriment, it can actually cause difficulties in their learning rather than help us to identify um, you know, how we can overcome them. We're convinced of the benefits of play-based learning for all of those reasons, which I'm sure um, a lot of you as P1 teachers will be familiar with. We think that um, play-based learning should look like that, um, you know, that, that should have these features here, and SNSAs, unfortunately, um, according to our members, look like that. That's all red. These are all things that our members were very concerned about. Um, again, the teacher voice is there, which you can read out later at your own leisure. Does all assessment genuinely support learning? Well, that first question is a resounding no for us so far. Um, you know, again, we're not jumping to conclusions. We're not uh, seeking to ballot our members um, on the basis of just one year's, you know, one year's um, experience of the assessments, but we're keeping a watching brief in relation to all of these other areas. So the rest of the questions there, um, formative assessment and teacher professional judgment central to the practice no they're not um, uh, you know these th that, that's not what we're seeing at all um, lots of issues in relation to, to those those different areas has time been allocated for meaningful professional dialogue I've already mentioned the training patchy local authority <laughs> determined um, it didn't come in time for um, you know for it to be accommodated within working time agreements for the first session it was a very incomplete picture in terms of um, people's experience of it we do know it's turned to orange we do know that there are um, plans afoot to um, improve the quality of the training for this year it remains to be seen whether whether that's how our, our members actually experience it and a real concern for us has been this misunderstanding about the purpose of the assessments the Scottish government was, was clear that the purpose was to inform teacher professional judgment and, the, and that the SNSA should be used within a wider context of assessment but that has not that message hasn't got to all of our members as clearly as it needs to have because people are talking about the assessments in terms of their ability to confirm their personal judgment as though their personal judgment is being tested somewhat by the by the assessments and that, that that's causing us a degree of concern as well 
Um, and the other thing that, that we have constantly tried to kind of bat back is this sense that the SNSAs are the be all and end all. In terms of the way that the, the, the politicians and the media have discussed the SNSAs, they've been given a profile that they don't deserve. They've been given a profile and an emphasis that they really don't deserve. And actually, if we were to give them that kind of a profile and emphasis, we would be causing damage to our, our young people's learning experience because we would have narrowing, we would have um, a, a kind of shift towards more of a high stakes experience for them than, than they're, they're intended to be. Um, so we're keeping a watching brief in these areas as well. Professional judgment I've already talked about. It's not there. Teacher voices again, whole cohorts of pupils being assessed at the same time, using the same assessment tool, yes they are, and that's one of the key principles of our assessment policy, that that shouldn't happen, it should be, be assessment should be bespoke to the needs of the, of the learner um, as the teacher judges them to be. We're what, keeping a watching brief in 6, 7 and 8, 9 and 10, are they passing the EIS test? So far, no, low. But, you know, in the spirit of formative assessment, two wishes and a star from the EIS for the Scottish Government. Try to keep faith with the sound principles of CFE and resist abandoning them when the going gets politically tough. Try to listen to teachers and learn to trust their professional judgment and don't be afraid to learn from your mistakes. And lastly, intensify the good work that's been done on moderation. That's the star for Scottish Government at the moment. A lot has been invested in that, but we need to build on that and we need to really soundly have a formative assessment and teacher judgment at the heart of all of our learning, teaching and assessment practice. Thank you. So that's a long question. So you wanted to know the percentage of respondents who had administered the P1 assessments. Mm. Um, so that was the main, the, the main question. We, uh, I would say about 98% of the people who responded to the survey overall had been involved in administering the assessments, but we asked um, teachers of P1, P4, P7 and S3. The vast majority of comments came from teachers who had administered P1 assessments. Um, so I didn't do a, a calculation of how, you know, what percentage they were of the 98%, but the vast majority of comments that we got that, that, that articulated concerns came from teachers who had taught P1 and who were involved either in, in administering the assessments themselves because they talked often about sitting beside young people to do them, or they talked about the kids being taken out of their classes while they continued with uh, learning and teaching as normal with the rest of the class. So there was a, you know, there were very, very few comments uh, to suggest that people who responded to the survey didn't uh, or weren't, weren't directly involved in SNSA administration of some kind. But I didn't break down like, how many were P1s, how many were S3s and, and so on. Only a, only a tiny minority actually were S3s, but the vast majority of the concerns articulated came from teachers who had administered P1. And I don't know about the, the comment about kids wetting themselves. I don't know that that came from our survey. I think that that might have appeared in the press. Um, yeah, 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 and I think I think that some I think that the press had gathered information from other sources, and um, besides besides the EIS, the other thing I should say about our survey was that we were conducting that for internal purposes. We were we were doing that as a, as, as part of our kind of ongoing monitoring, if you like, based on that AGM resolution from 2017. But we we kindly said that we would share it with the the Scottish Government um, NIF team who were working on standardised assessments. We did that over the summer, and then the information was FOI'd. So the the, the, the EIS did not seek to, to um, you know, distribute that information and have it within the public domain. That was, that was the consequence of an FOI. Is um, it possible for you to give us a breakdown at some point, not, not right now obviously, but at some point of the people who answered the questionnaires and what their backgrounds were and, and what their experience was? I could I could do that only by looking at the by looking at the comments that they made because we didn't ask them which which primary or which you know which year group did you teach because in some cases in some cases there were teachers who had responsibility for administering the assessments for P1 P4 P7 uh, in the same school, mm -hmm. depending on the role, you know. So we didn't ask that. We didn't ask that question specifically. Right. So I would have to go through counting comments to be able to do that. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Is, is it possible for the number of respondents that you have? And just a very, very. I think we, the, the the survey was open for two weeks, and we got 460 responses. That was just at the beginning of June. And again, we were not intending that to be you know, a big piece of scientific data. It wasn't that, it was a quick survey, quick snapshot survey of our members, but it ended up in the public domain and was given much greater, um, you know, profile than, than, than it would have had otherwise. Any other, got time for one more question. What was the potential number of respondents? Uh, well, we have, 
We have um, something in the region of 25,000 primary teachers who are our, who are our members, um, but all of them wouldn't have been involved in uh, wouldn't have been involved in SNSA delivery, and we don't even have a breakdown of you know, how many P1 teachers we have, how many P4 teachers we have. We don't have that kind of information. We don't ask for it uh, for our membership database. Um, so I couldn't, I couldn't give you a precise figure in terms of how many were involved in SNSA delivery because, um, as I said, schools did it differently. In some cases, it was class teachers delivering. Sometimes it was S uh, PSAs. Sometimes it was deputy heads. Sometimes supply teachers had been bought in to do it. So there was a real mixed picture in terms of how the SNSAs were being delivered. Thank you very much.